Hi. Hey. hey. Can you Hi hear there. me? I hear you fine. Right. Good. I got a new microphone. I'm not sure if it's clipping or anything. I hear you very well, so that's all right there. Good deal. Okay, so welcome everyone who's already watching. Welcome to the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. And as you can see, as a guest with us back is Dr. Jordan Grant. So welcome, Jordan. Thanks for having me, Stephen. So it's very nice to have you back. And um, let's maybe start with um, a bit personal news about you. So uh, you told me that you were uh, switching career. So uh, yeah, tell us more about that. Are you stopping the urology and what are you going to do instead? Correct. Yeah, which has been kind of a long time coming. You know, we've been talking about it for a while. Um, and we finally made the decision it was time to, to go ahead and get out of urology for many, many reasons. Um, everything that's gone on in the last three years kind of kind of leave a sour taste in your mouth for uh, mainstream, quote unquote, medicine and corporate medicine in general. This has nothing to do with where we're at, particularly. It's just as a whole. I wanted to be able to focus on my hormone replacement guys and really, you know, build relationships that way. And when we're full time urologists taking call all the time and doing surgeries and you just can't do that. It, it's you can't you've got to pick one or the other almost. And, you know, we've been getting busy enough with the hormone side of things that I felt like it was becoming almost a disservice to guys because it's hard for my nurse to keep up with their, you know, messages and needs because we have to do full time urology stuff, too. So, yeah, we. um we, my wife and I both gave our 90 day notice on August 1st. So our last day at Paris Urology will be um, October 27th. And uh, starting, I guess, November 1st, we'll probably start up our new, it'll be ready to go, which will just be called uh, Grant Hormone and Wellness, which will do, uh, you know, mainly telemed, I think, just because I have so many guys in Texas already doing telemedicine and, and my local guys can do that too. We'll, we'll, we'll have a physical space, but we're not jumping into that just right away because I don't, I don't want to spend a ton of money on a space that's like too big that we don't really need. So we want to really figure out what we want to do for that part of it. But I definitely do want to have a physical space, especially for my out of state guys, because they'll have to come, you know, once a year or something like that. Um, but we're, we're super excited. My wife got the website up and going. It's really kind of tentative at the moment. We're still going to kind of do some final touches to it, but it's just granthormone.com is the, we kept it easy. Um, I have no idea how to make it to be able to be find, found on Google Maps and all that. You have to verify your business, a bunch of stuff that I don't know about. So we're, we'll have to figure that part out. But yeah, we're super excited. Awesome. I'll put the link to your business uh, in the description of the video awesome. for everyone uh, to check out. So probably you will be able to take on new clients as well. Yeah, we will. Because I don't know, you know, when you're when you're employed, you can't I can't solicit my my current patients to come with me. They have to find me, right? And and reach out. I, and it sucks, but it's just the way it is. So obviously I'd love for all my current guys to come on board. You know, I know I know a lot of them won't because it's going to be a cash pay model. And a lot of these guys are used to using insurance. And I get that, but it's we're we're not doing insurance. It, it's a I don't want to be part of the insurance game at all. Um, I just I don't I don't want to do that. We're we're not going to hire staff. It's just going to be me and Leah running things. So we don't we don't have the manpower to do that, first of all, but I really don't, I don't think it's proper in order to get people truly optimized the right way. Getting insurance involved is just not a good thing. Um, but anyway, yeah, we're, yeah, it'll, it'll be kind of a work in progress. Um, but I'd love for, we'll, we'll be open to new patients and, um, I would love for my current guys to come find me if they want to, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I remember you telling me uh, you you always wanted or you have to see the patients at least once um, in front of you in the office uh, before doing telemed. So you will have to have uh, exactly. a space. Exactly. exactly. If that goes through, you know, the DEA kind of put a hiatus, not hiatus, but a moratorium on that where they're going to wait and see. So you basically have another year, I bet, until they announce what they do. I'll be curious if they kind of kick the can down the road for that a little more. But we yeah we're gonna have to have a physical place because a lot of people just i like meeting people in person right i, I like that one-on-one -on -one. um i i have no problem doing telemedicine with people first up front if they need to if they can't make it here but i do like seeing people and meeting them it, it does make it a different experience once you meet somebody face to face sure. um and again for the out-of-state guys you know we do have to do it that way i know the a lot of people still are confused about the out-of-state cross state line telemedicine and uh, I don't want to get into that just because 
you know, a lot of clinics are doing it, but uh, I've looked into it, you know, Justin Gross and I both have looked into it. Um, and it's not uh, as easy as people are making it out to be because of the DEA issue. If it wasn't a controlled substance issue, yeah, I could get a license in whatever state. We could do telemedicine, no problem. But with a controlled substance like testosterone, that changes everything. And so anyway, I, I like my, my out-of-state guys. I'm pretty lenient. You know, if once a year, give or take is what we kind of talk about. As long as we stay in touch over the phone and through messages and stuff like that, then I, I don't see any problem with that. All right. Yep. Great. So um, questions are coming in the chat box. Uh, I have put the chat box um on the YouTube uh, video as well. You can read the questions there oh, if yeah. you want. But before we go into the questions, um, as I proposed, I'd like to go over the results of the polls uh, we have put in our uh, community. Um, there are four different polls. Um, okay. I'll try to put them um, on the screen as well. Let me just figure out how to do that. <laughs> Um, okay, that's gone. And now find another window. Yes, there it is. Uh, oh, oh yes, 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 that's it. That's nice. It. Okay, so for everyone on TRT who feels optimized, so uh, without any um, low T symptoms, what is your weekly dose of testosterone on which you feel good? And there you can see the results. Um, yeah, most uh, most guys are in the 100 to 150 milligrams per week. Um, uh, one third of them are between 150 and 200 milligrams per week. And all the rest is slightly under. And there's a quarter of them over 200 milligrams per week as well, together mm -hmm. 15 and 10 percent. So please, Dr. Jordan, um, share your thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say that's in line with what I typically see. My guys are probably on the higher end, but a lot of uh, my guys are going to differ a little bit probably with the guys in the group. It's, I think a lot more guys in the group do um, more frequent dosing protocols and are fine with that. So you're going to need less total per week to if you're doing like every other day injections or every day. Whereas like my local guys, it's sometimes a struggle just to get them to do twice a week. So I see them more in that 160 to 200 milligram total a week range. Um, but I have noticed that as as guys explore more frequent injections, they go down on that total per week, which makes sense. You know, you're, you're minimizing the peaks and the troughs. So, yeah, this doesn't surprise me at all, especially with our group, because a lot of our guys do the more frequent protocol. Yeah. All right. So. Um, um, if you start them, um, on TRT for the first time, do you start low and go up gradually if needed, or do you have a number you always start with and then adjust the quarter? Yeah, I ballpark it. Um, a lot of times I will base it on their their BMI, believe it or not. I know, I know we act like that's not an issue, but it is. I mean, if, you, if I've got a, a guy that comes in, he's six foot five, 300 pounds. He's a massive man. He's probably not going to do great on 120 milligrams a week. You know, it's just... It might, but I usually am pretty generous. I'll start most guys around 80 milligrams twice a week. I think that's a good, reasonable starting place. When I started TRT nine years ago, I started on 100 milligrams twice a week. I started at the 200 a week. I was fine. That put my total at like 1,200, you know, six weeks into it. It was no big deal. Um, I think there's a lot of, I mean, everybody's different because some guys, yes, are sensitive to testosterone, but I would say on, on the bell curve, uh, even if you threw a guy on 200 a week, most guys, if they're in generally good health, they're probably not going to have any necessary issues with that up front. Um, but I'm a little more conservative just because, yeah, you just never know. Um, and it's the same thing with the cream, which we can talk about in a minute on the next poll. But yeah, for injections, I typically do if they're if they're brand new, like TRT versions and we're going to do the twice a week protocol. I think 80 milligrams twice a week is a decent starting point. Most of my guys probably on the bell curve end up at around 200 a week. Honestly, 100 twice a week is where, and I do have a few, maybe three or four guys that are on 400 milligrams a week total just to get their total over like 1200, just to get them to where their, you know, free T is in a good range, but that's rare. But, you know, somebody had posted in the group earlier today, like, oh, 200 milligrams a week, that's a cycle. <laughs> and so I'm going to go off on that real quick because it's a pet peeve, right? Cycle means you come off. 
first of all. So TRT, it's the, the word cycle goes out the window. Um, but you can't tell somebody they're doing a, a PED dose just based on the dose that you see on paper, right? Like, because if if I told you I had a guy on 400 a week and you said, oh, he's just he's just doing that to get big. It's like, you don't know that. You don't know this patient. You don't know the blood work that I've seen. So don't you can't make that universal claim like that. Uh, it drives me nuts when guys do that. And you have to take into account that these are individuals. These are people. And everybody responds differently for various reasons that we probably can't even ever figure out. Um, and that's why the whole point of this is symptom resolution is titrating your dose within reason. I mean, if some guy's like, I need to be at 3,500 total testosterone to feel my best, it's like, yeah, you probably don't. You're probably way past the point of testosterone being your problem, you know? And, and I get it that there's a, there's a line in the sand somewhere in there and everybody has their own line. For me, I'm, I'm pretty generous. I mean, I do have guys that might be 2000 total um, and they feel great. And they're like, I haven't felt better. They don't have any blood pressure issues. Their pulse rate's fine. Like they have no negative signs or symptoms. And usually I'm like, okay, that's fine. Just write, you know, be honest with yourself is what I tell patients. Be honest with yourself about how you feel. Don't just chase a high number because you think higher is better. Um, chase where you feel like a, a normal, good, healthy human being. <laughs> but anyway, I just wanted to go off about the saying certain is a cycle dose because that's anybody who's cycled before knows that 200 a week is not even close to a cycle dose. <laughs> so, Sure. Let me remove that one and find the other one. Okay, um, this is about the daily dose of cream. I'll put it on the screen now. All over the map. All those windows, there it is. Yeah, so about um, the compounded testosterone cream, we asked what is your uh, total daily dose of testosterone cream on which you feel good uh, or optimized. So, uh, and as we can see, the biggest group, almost one third of them, are on 50 milligrams daily, that I found very low. Yeah. Then uh, fifth is on 100 milligrams daily, so that's two clicks of 50 milligrams. Then uh, set only 17% on 150, 17% on 200 milligrams daily, and 20%, then 150 again, is over 200 milligrams daily. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on these uh, daily doses? Yeah, this makes sense, actually. If you think about it as a total percentage, only 27% are at that low dose. So 73% are 100 or more. And so I, that is actually pretty common what I see. It's all over the map. Um, so when I start a guy on cream, I kind of, again, we just got to start somewhere, right? You got to ballpark it based on what you typically see, what your anecdotal experience is. So I usually start guys on two clicks in the morning of the 20% cream. And then I'll usually tell them to just do, if they're going to do an evening dose, just start with one click just to kind of see how they feel when they sleep. Because some guys, if they jump to two clicks in the evening and the morning, they may be waking up at three, four in the morning, just like, you know, wide awake, uh, amped up. Cause some guys, this stuff is potent. And I know people like to bad mouth the cream. Uh, I don't know why, cause it is, it's, it's very potent. It's probably the second closest thing you could get to like testosterone suspension from the old days. Right. Even that was quicker acting cause you had to dose it like three or four times a day probably. Um, but it's very potent. So you, but you got to start somewhere. Uh, but I've got guys who'll do two clicks a day and that puts them at 1200. I got some guys that do two clicks a day and only puts them at 500. Those usually are my poor responders who probably aren't going to do great on cream. And then I've got guys where two clicks a day puts them with three or 4,000. And I have seen this. And so that for those guys, we'll always repeat the blood work at first, just to make sure it wasn't a lab error. Um, but if it's not, we'll, we'll lower their concentration. I've actually got quite a few guys on just 10% strength cream and they may only need like one click a day to get. So yeah, everybody, it's really dependent on that absorption rate and the scrotal skin. If they're all, all things being equal, if they're, if they're doing scrotal application, um, that, that absorption is kind of, it's varied, you know, but I will say in general, most guys do really well with cream. I think I've only had four or five guys total in five years that just, excuse me, didn't seem to absorb it at all. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't know if there were other factors there that maybe they weren't putting it on right. I don't know. But yeah, this, these numbers actually don't surprise me. Since you're so enthusiastic about the cream, as I am myself, um, 
are you starting up more and more guys on the cream yeah. without them even asking or yeah. what, what, on what is your choice based? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of guys are kind of finding out about it. And I mean, you know, around town here locally, you know, a few guys get on cream and they feel great. They'll go tell their friends, hey, I got on this cream. You need to go talk to Dr. Grant, ask him about the cream. So it's kind of a, a selection bias there. But uh, I just tell them, you know, yeah, I'm on it. I do it. I try not to bias them with what I'm doing. So I do tell them I did injections for eight years and there's really nothing wrong with injections at all. You have to trial and error what's best for you. And but if I get a guy that comes in and they're, you know, I start talking about needles and injections and they're like, I can't do injections like immediately. They're just, you know, they go white when you mention needles. No, they need cream to stay, at least to try. Now, if cream doesn't work for them, sure, we can ease them into the injection part if we have to. Um, but I've got more and more guys interested in the cream because it works so well. And uh, I mean, I'm a testament to that, right? I, I, I kept talking about changing for years, you know, you, you doing it and the other guys in the group doing it and talking to me saying, Hey, you got to try it. And I was like, ah, finally, once I did, I mean, I haven't looked back. I mean, I, I feel like a, like a different person, honestly, on it, just from a, like a mental clarity standpoint, it's like everything just kind of, opened up, uh, the brain fog went away. I just, I feel good. I don't feel amped up. I don't, you know, these guys who want to feel it, quote unquote, they want to feel the testosterone. I have guys that say that that's not how this works. Like you don't feel it when you take it, you just feel good all the time. I mean, you just want to feel like a normal human being. You want to feel healthy. You want to have good mental clarity. Um, I feel mentally like I did in my twenties, you know, um, maybe not sex drive wise, but that's normal because as you get older, life stress gets more. There's more going on, you know. And so but yeah, um, I, I do have a lot more guys that are interested in the cream. Right. I'll remove and close that one. Then the third poll. Yeah. Open up the window. Yes, there it is. So uh, the question was, what is your measured total testosterone level at which you feel optimized with no more low T symptoms? And as you can see from the poll, 17% said between 500 and 750 nan nanograms per deciliter. One third, the biggest group was between 750 and 1000 nanograms per deciliter. One quarter 27 percent between 1000 and um, uh, 1250 13 percent 1250 to 1500 and 10 percent still higher than 1500 nanograms per deciliter total tea so what are your thoughts yep again you got to look at both this and the free tea which is the next one but um you know, when I give my spiel in the clinic to people and they'll ask kind of like about what targets I look for, which I tell them I'm really not looking for a target number because I, I try to go off of symptoms. I really true to, do try to stand by that. But I will tell them again on the bell curve with my patients, if you get a guy 900 to 1500, somewhere in that range, you're, they're probably going to find their sweet spot, which I call like the Goldie. There's a Goldilocks zone, right? There's an area where they can feel the same with varying numbers. It's never going to be the same every day. Um, and that, that kind of goes with the poll here. If you look at this as a bell curve, you know, I mean, the 1500 is kind of way up there, but I do m most guys I see, like I know personally when I'm 12 to 1500 uh, and my free T is, you know, high twenties to low to high thirties uh, is where I've felt the best. I mean, granted, I haven't done a truly controlled, study on that it's hard because you can't control for every variable in your life at all times you just can't you got to go off and again that's why it's subjective it's it's based off of how the person feels so that's you kind of have to take these with a grain of salt but this does match up with what i tend to see in reality um, so it just kind of confirms what we already talk about yeah of course these levels uh depend on the moment on which the blood is taken exactly. so what is the advice you give for the blood draw uh, on the trough with injections yep. probably yep trough with injections and believe it or not peak with cream and i know people think that's backwards and weird um i don't really care about the trough with cream you're not going to have much of a trough with cream um the main reason i test peak is it's not only about if it was peak or not but four to six hours after application I just want to make sure they're absorbing it well. That's all I care about. After that, it's all on them to titrate their number of clicks to see where they feel the best. 
I don't really care about the number that much. It, it, and I know that's really hard for people who are so lab focused and I think it bothers them. And I just have to continually remind them that I don't really care about the number. It's just, do you absorb it? I don't want you wasting your money on the cream if you don't absorb it. After that, we just dial it in, you know, based on that. So injection wise, the reason you do, and it doesn't have to be a trough per se, but you don't want an artificial peak with an injection. We got into this a few weeks ago with a guy in the group who kind of waffled around about it for a minute, but saying that, and he was right, but he was talking about cream and he was wrong on that part. But injections, yes, let's say you inject testosterone and you go get your blood work done right away. You're going to get, in my opinion, you're going to get that testosterone gets in the bloodstream immediately when you inject a little bit. The, the depot formed but some of it's going to get in there and you are going to get an artificial high and i've seen that before where guys do their blood work the morning of an injection and they go get it and their blood works like 3500 whereas if we tested it you know a day later even or two days later they're going to be more normal 1200 whatever and i've seen that many times so that's the issue with injections it's not per se that we need a true trough because again it's more about symptom resolution and again the trough comes in more play with guys who aren't dosing very frequently so like, let's say it's a once a weeker and some guys do get away with that, but let's say that two days after their injection, they're at 1300 and five days after injection, they're at 400. So they're metabolizing this quickly. It's, it's running through their system quick. That might be worth knowing. So you, that way, if they start feeling weird, you go, Hey man, you're bottoming out really quick. You need to go to more frequent injections. So that's sort of the art of all this is just knowing and thinking about the timing and how these things fluctuate. And, and then you take that data and try to, you know, do something for the patient to implement a change for the better. So, but yeah. there's no hard and fast rules on this stuff. The last poll was indeed about the pre. Let me add that one. Pre T. Yes. And the question here was, uh, what is your free testosterone level at which you feel optimized with no more low T symptoms? Well, um, 10% was lower than 20 nanograms per deciliter free T, 28% between 20 and 30, 29% between 30 and 40, 10% between 40 and 50, and 22% still higher than 50 nanograms per deciliter. Nice. So what do you think? Yeah, it's, uh, I would say in general, yeah, we always quote 20 to 40 is kind of the range. I quote people where they're going to find their sweet spot. Some guys need more. I definitely have had a few guys with like, doc, I've just, I tried going lower, but I get it up of 50, 60. I feel fantastic and I'm not having any negatives. Can I stay here? I'm like, yeah, that's fine. If you truly are being honest with yourself that that's where you need, and this could go into like the androgen resistance type theories that people have, you know, where again, numbers are not, we're not just like, we're not just machines. We're not just cars where you can run a diagnostic and tell you everything that's going on. That's not how blood work works. Uh, it's a snapshot in time. It's a balance sheet basically, but there's also all these other variables that you can't even know what are going on. So you, you gotta, you gotta go with how you feel. And I know doctors hate that. Uh, they want rough data so they can just make their little algorithmic decision. Um, it just doesn't work like that. And, you know, so that, and patients have trouble with that too, because they, they want an answer based on the blood work. And it's just not that simple. Um, and I understand there's going to be guys that game the system and try to be like, no, I just need to be at 3000 to feel my best. And, you know, that's on them at, at the end of the day, it is going to be on them. We, we all have to take personal responsibility for our actions. And, and I, I, as a provider can draw my line in the sand there if I want to, um, or I could go with, Hey, I'm going to believe this guy and say, no, he, he actually does need to be at 3000 and a free tea of 80 to feel his best. But if you start seeing uh, weird things in his blood work, you know, other than, you know, like kidney function changes, getting worse, blood pressure's going up, heart rate's going up. He feels bad. It's not getting erections. He's going to eventually start talking about that. And then you go, yeah, you're probably running way too high. I mean, it just is what it is. Now, thankfully I don't have to deal with that. Most of my guys that I see are really honest. They're not trying to gain the system to, to get prescribed TRT for anabolic purposes. Like you can't prescribe that much. It's just not really, unless somebody's a hyper responder, but I see these guys in person. I know what they look like. I can tell what, you know what I mean? Like we talk about this stuff. And so you can kind of get a feel of somebody's being honest about something or not, or if they're trying to play you. 
Um, sorry for that tangent, but it's just important because again, people just doctors, especially like if, if people could see what standard doctors believed or thought about hormones, I mean, they'd be, they'd be appalled how doctors talk about patients who seek hormone treatment. Uh, it's pathetic because they think everybody's just trying to get big or trying to be a bodybuilder. And that's not what it's about. These guys just want to feel better. They want to function like a normal human being. And these idiot providers don't have a clue what it's like. Uh, you think they would because most of them are super unhealthy and probably having these same symptoms, but they're just, they're so indoctrinated against hormones that they, they're missing out on, on a lot of the benefits too. But, um, anyway, again, that was kind of <laughs> tangent to the free tea thing, but yeah, in general, I think, and I've noticed this too, personally, like when I've, I've had a free tea of 80 nanograms per deciliter, uh, I didn't feel well. I just felt not, it wasn't terrible, but you just don't feel like yourself. You get some brain fog, you erections go away too soon. Like things just aren't clicking in your body and you, your body kind of tells you when it's not happy. And so that's what I want to encourage all guys is really try to find now don't overthink it. Don't constantly be okay. Now I'm at 25. Can I feel better at, at 28? And now can I feel better at 30? You know what I mean? They'll, they'll go through and they'll be so anxious about this stuff. It's like, it's a range just find where you start feeling better and then forget about it. Get stay on your testosterone, but don't even think about it every day anymore. Just do it and then go focus on the rest of your life and get everything else in order. One extra question I have here. Um, one of the main complaints of low libido uh, of um, low testosterone is uh, having a low libido. Um, and surely as a urologist, you have heard that tons of times. Um, but when you increase the dose and the levels go up, 1,000, 1,200 nanograms per deciliter total, and the pre uh, 20, 30, 40 nanograms per deciliter levels go up, and the libido remains um, very low or uh, in existence. Mm -hmm. When do you look for other things, or uh, do you keep increasing the testosterone dose? So how to go about that? I haven't found increasing it more and more helps the libido. It's just not that simple. Libido, as we've talked about in the group so many times, there's so many factors variables that go into it. Uh, stress would be the number one thing. And almost everybody's stressed out. Stress in their work life, stress in their home life, stress in their marriage, sleep quality being poor, diets being crap. Like honestly, marital relation, like marital health is a big one that I think people, you know, because that helps my wife and I. I mean, we've focused on that over the last year and it's better than ever. And it has nothing to do with my hormones. I mean, it really is a change in mindset that I think too many people are so caught up in the rat race of life that they forget to focus on their relationships with their wife, first and foremost, their kids, their community, like that we're also sucked into this, into the data and the screens and, the, and all this. And you're looking for a scapegoat, right? You're looking for that testosterone to be the problem for your libido. And we see this all the time. People do it without weight loss. So oh, it's my hormones. That's why I can't lose weight. It's like in some people, yeah, hormones do, do kind of click that button to help them. But in, in most cases, that's not it, but they want it to be that because the, the true hard work comes on on this side, right? on the mental and, and spiritual and psychological side. So libido is so tricky. And because and, like I'll see guys that never had low libido issues, but had all the other low T symptoms and had low T. And then, you know, they were never an issue with in the bedroom as far as libido. And then there's guys that have great testosterone and, you know, you just can't get the libido where they want it to be. And a lot of that, I think, too, is expectation. Like, what are their expectations for their libido? Like it. I think I'll never forget. It was a three or four years ago in the group. Some guy posted like I'm on testosterone and uh, I don't get a hard on when I walk around and see a pretty woman all every time I see a woman on the street. I'm like, that's like perverted. Like you don't need to go back around seeing a pretty woman and getting an erection. That's that's a that's a wrong expectation that somebody had put in his head. Right. Like you, you're asking for trouble if you're going to walk around like that, you know, so setting expectations is everything just like in surgery likes the same thing you have to set expectations ahead of time and i think that's the biggest part of being a provider in hormone replacement is setting expectations and talking people almost off a ledge at times because they've got this idea of what hrt is when in reality it's not that and you want to kind of bring them back down to reality and start looking at the bigger picture and that's that's part of what we do that we love so much is getting people to actually just hormones are a tiny part right it's just the it's either it depends on how you look at it i say it's either the foundation or it's the icing on the cake either way it's just a small part right you got to do all these other things to get your life in order um libido though too like like make sure they're not on aromatase inhibitor if you're on an aromatase inhibitor 
your libido is probably going to be tanked because estradiol is a big driver of libido. And we see that in, in the female side as well. I saw a post today in the female group about a woman who's postmenopausal on testosterone only, and she doesn't understand why her libido is bad. And then somebody asked her, what's your estrogen? And it was eight. It's like, well, there you go. That's where I would start. You need to be in estradiol, you know, so because that is a big driver of, of libido. So aromatase inhibitors in men, as you know, we, we're passionate about that. But there's so many reasons not to do one, and that's a big one. Uh, so, yeah. Great. Let's go back to our um, chats. Let me have a look. Uh, a lot of uh, chattering been going on. So I'll start um, on top there. Um, how can I read my free testosterone while on TRT? Very general question. Anything you want to add there? No, you take more testosterone. Like that's one that people ask all the time. Like, oh, I want to take boron. I want to do this. I want to go high carb or lower my SHBG. No, don't artificially manipulate your SHBG. Let it be what it's going to be. Just if you need higher free T to re reach symptom resolution, just take more testosterone. It's really that simple. Don't overthink it. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm 31 and I used um, AAS when I was 21, 27. Now of all those uh, that stuff uh, since almost six years, my testosterone is at three, uh, 360. Having poor libido um, would TRT help? Yeah. I mean, in my, in my opinion, I can't obviously tell somebody that definitively. I mean, that's the, so don't take this as medical advice. Um, but yeah, most guys who say that was where I was, right? I cycled through college 18 to 21. And when I was 30, my testosterone was 315 and I had symptoms and I didn't do anything about it until I was 34 when my testosterone was down to below 300. Um, so I basically just short circuited my own system, probably. I mean, I, don't, I can't prove that. There's so many things now causing low T, it could be anything. But absolutely, if you're symptomatic, you've got the number two there, but that doesn't matter as much. But I, I think if I saw you in clinic, I'd say, yeah, testosterone will likely tick a lot of the boxes that you need to be ticked. Yeah. Um, okay. I find that topical progesterone helps my idiopathic neuropathy. It seems to be somewhat relaxing. Have you experienced using it? Nope. And I won't, I won't prescribe progesterone. I will not prescribe progesterone for a man. I just won't. I know there's people that do that. And again, you have to differentiate between taking something just to get an effect that you like versus taking it and not realizing the other effects that's going on in your body. And men really aren't meant to take progesterone. Um, you know, you can, and I, we always use this, and I'm not knocking what you're doing. I mean, you're a, an adult. If, if it helps your neuropathy and it keeps you off of opioids, go for it. You know, you might be better off taking some nandrolone instead of progesterone because you might get the similar a similar effect. I don't know. Um, but we could go with any drug that does this. Right. Like, you know, people who self-medicate with alcohol or whatever. Like it's yeah, it might help that one thing. But then you're causing maybe some other issues you don't know. So I think a lot of you know, I know Dr. Ruggier thinks progesterone is very pro-inflammatory. I, I don't know that for sure. I haven't really looked that deep into it as far as you're not going to find a lot of studies on exogenous progesterone administration in males. You just aren't. Uh, I've looked and it's, it's pretty slim pickings out there. So I think what a lot of people do is they take association and correlation studies with endogenous levels and try to make claims about those. And that we got to be careful with that because that's not that's not how it's done. So. Um, I'm just not, I'm not a progesterone prescriber for men. No. Um, Todd on RU58841 uh, on test. I don't know. Um, I, I don't even know which one that is. That's not one of the, um, is that the progestin? Let me look, because that's not one. I'm bad with those stupid numbered drugs. If that's the one I'm thinking about. Yeah, the anti-androgen. Um, why would anybody take that? So anything that works against it's like it's like women who take spironolactone when their testosterone that they're taking is too high. It makes no sense. Don't take something to block the effects of the hormone you need to be working for you. Um, you know, anti-androgens like casodex and those kind of things are given to men in the old school with metastatic prostate cancer. 
Um, and if you want a quick case of gynecomastia, you can take an antiandrogen. Now, this one being non-steroidal may have a different action, but I have no experience with it. And I'm sure a lot of guys are doing it probably for like replace finasteride or something like that, if I had to guess, um, which don't do. You don't want to block DHT. You don't want to block the effects of DHT, the conversion to DHT. The same thing with all this. Do, there's no reason for anyone to be taking a poison to short circuit the body from doing what it's supposed to do, because that's what these are. And I, I think I mentioned this a lot in the group and it needs to be reiterated because people don't like that word poison. It's just look up the definition of the word poison and what it is. It's literally something that inhibits a natural process in the body. That's what aromatase inhibitors do. That's what finasteride does. That's what so many of these like blood pressure pills, so many of these, almost most of big pharma crap that aren't really like hormones are a different category, right? But like, most of these things are short circuiting something your body's supposed to be doing because you like that one effect it's giving you or your doctor likes that effect when in reality blocking that effect is not actually getting you any benefit it's actually causing harm you're getting a small benefit for some subjective need like oh i'm not losing my hair as fast okay great what are you doing to your body what are you doing to your health like so it's it's a balancing act right and everybody has to make that decision but personally i will not prescribe any of the things for that reason, because I think that's against health, causing harm. And we make an oath to do no harm. So if somebody wants to take those, I'm like, more power to you. You can go find out where to buy them and get it, take it yourself. So, Yeah, 100%. Do no harm. That's what uh, our oath says. But um, I have the impression a lot of doctors forgot that the last few that's years. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, most of them. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on DHT and NTAID? I rarely hear anyone talk about it, but since DHT is much more potent than T, I would assume it can be very powerful. Mm, I've never heard of DHT and NTAID. I wonder if they're talking about D DHB or... Yeah, maybe that's something you're... I've, and I'm pretty familiar with most anabolics and I've not seen DHT and NTAID, but I, may, I haven't kept up that much in the last few years. Um, to give pure DHT is usually just done in clinical trials where they're trying to ascertain effects of DHT. So I don't see any reason to take exogenous DHT. Like your body, there's a difference between what you convert to DHT, just like with estrogen, right? The aromatized E2 is different than, because people always straw man me about that. They're like, oh, Dr. Grant just wants you to take estrogen. I'm like, no. There's a difference between what your body makes and needs based on the testosterone you give it versus taking it exogenously. So I don't go around telling guys to start taking estrogen because then you're that's not natural anymore. Right. You're you're you don't have a clue what's going to happen with that. It's the same thing with DHT or any anabolics that are DHT derivative anabolics. We don't know if those are safe long term. Or, but what would be the point? I guess what was this question about <sighs> much more potent than tea? I think the problem is going to be is that the from what they say about receptors, which, you know, there's a lot of that stuff that's kind of hocus pocus, but DHT has certain effects in the body where testosterone doesn't and vice versa. So you're going to get more of a systemic benefit from the testosterone and then converting where it needs to be into DHT. Uh, and whereas like, cause I think it's, is it muscle that DHT actually conversion is broken down too fast? You don't get that effect. That's why DHT derivatives with certain changes work on the muscle. They have to change that to make it not be broken down by the enzyme, right? And so when you start taking pure DHT, I mean, what's the point there, I guess, would be my question. You're gonna drive SHBG down, sure, but that's artificial. So why not just take more testosterone to do you it? You have the same question uh, about um, topical DHT cream uh, as well. Yeah. Uh, recently. Uh, I don't see the, I think guys do that to kind of chase the dragon or libido or something. It's like when they take Proviron. Um, they, you know, and Dave Lee's talked about this a lot because we don't see Proviron here in the U.S., um, but it's it's seen in Europe, I think, quite a bit. Yeah. And yes, you can get a transient benefit where you'll you'll feel good for maybe four weeks where your libido enhances. But that usually happens with any kind of change with a protocol. When you add something new or you do some kind of fluctuation, libido does tend to respond for whatever reason. It doesn't stay that way. And so these guys end up, I think they chase that libido dragon for the most part. And I tell them, don't do that because it's not, you can't. Your, your, your libido is not meant to be sky high all the time. I mean, some people are made that way, but most people aren't. So just be careful with taking that kind of non-bioidentical non thing. I mean, DHT, obviously bioidentical, but 
it's not the same. It's supposed to be converted. We're supposed to convert to DHT. Um, but do what you want. <laughs> Andreas Taylor there. Um, I've been on, I've been on TRT ten years. I have problem with the red face looking unburned hot flashes. I have listened to you guys not going on estrogen control. When I tried uh, low dose Mastron, the red goes away. Why? I have no idea why that would happen. Because I've seen the opposite. I've seen guys who take DHT derivatives and they get that reddish, ruddy skin color. Uh, and I see their hematocrit hemoglobin go up higher. So this is one of those cases of kind of the post hoc ergo propter hoc, where just because something happened after you took something, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what caused it. You have to prove that. Um, and most guys, you don't see the ruddy issues on TRT. So I'd probably start looking at something deeper into your health. I mean, I can't say I've ever had that issue. My skin looks more tan, I guess, now that I'm on TRT for the last nine years. My wife always tells me I kind of always have a tan, but it's not that red. I know what you're talking about with the red. Um, and I've seen guys post about that in the group, but I don't have a good answer for that. You know, some people think it's a histamine response. Um, you know, they get the itching when they get out of the shower, right? You get warm in the shower and you get out and you get the itchy skin and stuff like that. They used to blame that on erythrocytosis. I've seen that blame, but most, we all have the erythrocytosis on TRT and most guys don't get that issue. So I think there's something else going on there. I don't know if a dermatologist, if you know more about that, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, we have a lot of uh, different skin tones. It's uh... Yeah, it's not only the, the pigmentation, the tan, um, yeah, the, the blood in the skin. Some people just have more blood vessels. Some people are always uh, yellowish. There are different mm -hmm. types of melanin in the skin as well. Um, yeah, there's a whole mix and different skin tones. I'm always reddish, not yeah. just because now it's 35 degrees Celsius in here and we don't have air cool here because, uh, yeah, it, it almost never is hot, but now it is. <laughs> um, there's a, a Indian summer going on here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's very hot. So uh, I know. I've been sweating all day. <laughs> We've been sweating all summer. It's, today's the first day. It's actually kind of cooled off a little bit. So it was nice, but it's been 100 plus degrees for months on end. So yeah, painful. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go over this. <clears throat> Domin Balahir, I know who that is. Um, also, five milligrams DHEA now. If I do over 12, five milligrams, I can't sleep. Is this normal? If I don't take it uh, uh, any, I feel it too. My brain works less efficient. Hmm. Yeah, it's a tight window there between five and 12.5. And there's some people that take, you know, 100 milligrams, but. I never felt better on DHEA. I see more issues with DHEA supplementation than a lot of other things um, as far as anxiety, feeling wired, acne. So again, trial and error. There's nothing. Why, why go over 12.5 if that's where you feel bad? You don't and don't chase the blood work on DHEA. It's not going to be it's not going to be as useful as you think. You, this is one of those things where you titrate the dose to where you feel right. If it's five milligrams, stay there. Don't keep pushing it higher if you don't need to or you push it higher and you feel worse. Go back. That's all you got to do. A uh, lot of questions. Um, talking about AIs here, but uh, you're not big fans of those. <laughs> they can watch our videos on that. We've beaten that horse to death. Yeah, people, please don't take any uh, aromatas inhibitors. That's right. I'd like to hear Dr. Grant speak a little on his personal diet and training philosophies. Yeah. So that's changed a lot over the years, I think. Um, I've actually become a less is more guy lately. I've been, we've been we've been maintaining for the last few months doing like two sets of each exercise, like just to maintain our muscle. Uh, my wife and I work out together and it's been great, but obviously we didn't get there doing that. I mean, there are guys that advocate the high intensity, you know, like Mike Mincer style, Dorian Yates style. I'm not convinced those guys grew their muscle on those protocols. I think they were able to grow more early in life and then they kind of pushed a little harder with anabolics and, and high intensity still kept on growing. But 
I don't know. Um, but I, I like it. I like the thought behind that. I think you can, my philosophy is do, it's kind of like with testosterone, find what works for you. And you can find that in more ways than one. Um, I like working out and trying to hit everything twice in eight days. Like, so, so every eight days I try to run through everything. Um, I'll do like four on one off or something like that. I do like a push pull and then a quad dominant with accessories and then a hamstring day with accessories. I like splitting up my quads and hams. I hate doing them together because it just wrecks me. I don't have enough energy to really push to do both properly. Um, and for diet, same thing. Like, I mean, macros, calorie counting. Yes. All that works great. That's how I lost 52 pounds seven years ago. You know, when I got out of residency, my last year of residency, just by counting calories and, and learning how to weigh my food. And then now, now that we're past that point in our lives, we focus on actual trying to find good quality foods because you can lose fat and all that on crap food, but it's not going to be healthy internally for you. So I, we're trying to find now to push ourselves to find truly organic, you know, grass fed beef and local free range chickens and raw milk. And I mean, all the things, you know, that a lot of people poo poo. And I poo pooed that when I was younger, I was like, ah, it's not that big a deal. Cause all I cared about was weight loss. I didn't care about the health part. And now that I'm in my forties, you know, almost 44, it's like, yeah, I kind of want to think about health too. And what's going on internally that I put in my body. Um, I like a lot of Mike Israel stuff. I like Renaissance periodization. I think they're a little maybe high end on the volume recommendations, but it's not a cookie cutter protocol because they do base it off of, you know, minimum effective volume, maintenance volume, minimum effective, maximum recoverable volume. And people take that as like in stone, like that's what they have to do. And it's not, it's find your own MRV and MEV and all those things. So I think people like to misrepresent Mike about some of that stuff. I think he's got a good training philosophy. High volume can work. It works for natural guys. I mean, I've seen it with like Steve Hall from Revive Stronger follows Mike Israel's stuff and he's progressing great over the years doing these protocols. He's totally natural. Um, so you got to find what works for you. Some guys love starting strength and they love total body three days a week. I think as a beginner that works, but I think you'll wreck yourself over time. It's hard to, I did total body three days a week for a while in med school and I, I stalled out real quick, especially if you're pushing yourself hard, you know, try to, to failure doing the four big lifts three days a week, plus some accessories, yeah. not on anabolics. You're going to wreck yourself in my opinion, you know? Um, so again, I'm more of a, Keep it in the middle. You know, I think a lot of guys do fine with the bro splits. They do fine with that. One day a week, hit hit everything and then take a couple of days off. That can work fine. I think it works better if you're on anabolics. I think for the more natural guys, I think hitting things twice in a week, like either an upper lower rest and repeat or a push pull type thing works really push pull legs, I think works really well. And then diet just for people truly wanting to get leaner. You've got to know what you're putting in your body. You have to. I mean, there's just no getting around it. it. You can just cut out some things for a while and gain and lose a little weight. But if you want to dial in and get sub 10% body fat, um, you're going to have to start weighing your food and knowing exactly what's going in your body so you can make the adjustments that you need. And I, I'll say that to a lot of my patients and they're kind of their eyes glaze over because they'll tell me, Doc, I've tried everything to lose weight. And I'll, I'll ask them, did you have you bought a food scale? And they kind of look at me like I'm crazy, like, no, I haven't done that. I'm like, then that's, you got to do that. And most of them won't. And it, it just works. I mean, it's that simple. It's simple, but it's hard. There's a difference between something being you know, simple and easy, uh, simple conceptually, but it's hard to implement because of uh, we, we all like to eat and, we, and being hungry is not fun too. So you, everybody's got to pick where they want to be. If you're happy being 15% body fat or 18, that's a healthy body fat. I mean, honestly, for guys that are fit and if you have muscle, you probably don't need to be necessarily counting. And I don't weigh everything anymore um, because I already know from weighing it in the past, I know what I eat and how much is kind of in what. And so I think that's the beauty of weighing your food. Even if you only have to do it, do it for a year or something just to train yourself what certain sizes of portions look like. Then you may not have to weigh down the road because you kind of already, you've already learned that. So, yeah. Yeah. Still a lot of questions coming in. Um, yeah. 10 more minutes, 15 more minutes, maybe. So um, if you want your question to pop up, maybe use the super chat uh, option. I'll just uh, pick a few there. Um, Joe Rogan, because he's a known person, of course. Questions for Dr. Grant. <laughs> I have been on CRT, 140 milligrams per week for one year. Is it safe to stay on Arimidex? Joe Rogan, yeah. 25, uh, 0.25 milligrams every five days with my shot. I don't want to keep taking 
anti-estrogen meds, but I can't lower estro. <laughs> That's not the real Joe Rogan. Um, I, not. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you again, you can't, you don't want to lower your estradiol. You don't need to be checking it. The serum level is not, is not indicative of your tissue levels. And I know people don't like hearing that. We've made that video. I've given the backup files and evidence and all these things. Checking that serum level is nearly useless unless it's maybe at zero. Um, but as far as any other levels, when you're not blocking it, it's not useful because it's not telling you what you think it is. And so you, you don't need to check it, number one, because that's the first thing I see with guys is they got it in their head that they got to check it. And it's always going to be over normal when you're taking testosterone. When your free T is high, where it should be when you're feeling good, your, your serum E2 is going to be high. It will be. I mean, 99% of the time. And that's not, that's normal. That's, that's how the serum level reads. It's still not telling you whether you're having quote unquote high estrogen issues because estrogen is made in the tissues. The testosterone has to get into the tissue first, then it's converted. So what you're getting in the serum is not indicative of what's in your, whatever organ you pick or tissue you want to pick where it's being converted by aromatase specifically for that tissue for its needs. And so that's the biggest point that people need to understand. And I saw a guy recently, somebody screenshotted it for me from another group, a TRT group on Facebook saying that, oh, Dr. Grant's just making that up. No, Dr. Grant doesn't make things up. I do not. I, I may do a lot of things, but I will not lie to people and I will not make things up. That's why we did the video and I posted the papers. So if these people have an issue with that, they can contact the author of those papers and, and figure out what's going on. But it makes sense if you think about it, right? Like the, the aromatization process is not happening in the bloodstream. It's not the testosterone is not magically converting to estrogen as it floats around in the blood. It's got to get into the tissues and same with DHT gets into the tissues, converts. So stop chasing the number. And just once you get that out of your head and you understand this, you forget about it, you'll feel better. Honestly. I mean, I've had so many guys where I just have to talk them down and say, stop checking it. Stop it. The, the normal estradiol ranges that are given on lab work were not made for men on TRT. Those are baseline ranges. They have nothing to do with where anything should be when you take an exogenous hormone. That is another point we have to drive home. And doctors are such morons when it comes to understanding this. How they don't understand that an exogenous substance, the ranges don't matter anymore because those ranges weren't made for people taking exogenous substances. Those are baseline levels that they try to correlate with things. So just we chase blood work way too much. We really do. That's the, that's the gist of it. Yeah. An interesting question there. Um, I hear many guys that go on PED dosages of tests alone and say that the more they take, the better they feel. But then in TRT circles, I hear people say that more isn't better. It's confusing. Those. Yeah, I agree. And I've heard the same. But if you're if you talk to again, the bodybuilding population is a very specific population. So you're getting selection bias there from guys who are chasing certain goals that are not necessarily the same goals that a TRT normal guys chasing, right? So when they're saying I'm feeling great, it may be a fantastic workout. It may be great recovery. It may be building more muscle and they like what they see in the mirror. It may be, they, maybe they do feel great and that's fine. Again, some guys can feel fantastic on high testosterone. And I mean, I could take a thousand milligrams of testosterone right now and probably not feel bad. Now, once I'm on that long enough, will I start having some negatives? Yes. Does that mean I feel terrible? No. Um, I've, I've done cycles before of high testosterone. I took 1250 milligrams a week in college for like eight or 10 weeks. I, I didn't, I didn't have any issues that I know of then it worked. Um, now as I'm older, would I have some blood pressure issues and some erection issues from that? Probably. Would I still feel okay as far as day to day? I feel okay. It wouldn't be like low T. Um, but there are some guys that are super sensitive and they just don't need as much. And that's so we're again, this goes back to the N of one, the individual, because people are not statistics. Statistics are crap. Statistics are, are an abstraction. They don't tell you anything about you, right? They're really good at scaring people or giving people some kind of false hope, or they're really good at maybe looking into an issue further with true controlled trials or actual science, but they are not scientific. So the statistics that you get, it may make you feel better mentally to know, oh, on the bell curve, whatever, that's fine, but it really doesn't matter because you're you. So you have to explore where you feel best with whatever dose. So that's, 
that don't compare yourself to other people when it comes to that because people tolerate all kinds of stuff there's people that drink a lot of beer every day and don't have any issues from it there's people that can't tolerate one beer you know what i mean like it's all the same so. what's your view on test e versus test c very little uh difference i know i know guys that say i feel better on e than c great i'll prescribe e you know what i mean like it really there's on paper there's really not much difference does that mean in reality no that's why again i go off what people tell me um cypionate is usually the more common compound in the united states whereas enanthate is more common in europe so a lot of times it's more just an availability thing now with compounded we can do either one i've got a few guys that do compounded enanthate and they love it uh, for whatever reason so I, I i'd go off what they tell me and i try to you know believe them so mm. I notice on scrotal cream, I lose hair at a faster rate than injections. But you're saying that the blood level DHT isn't causing this. No, I, well, yeah, the blood level, that doesn't mean the scalp level is not causing it. Like you could be converting more just because you have a higher free testosterone. Like the, the tea cream is more potent. So it would make sense that you might actually have more hair loss with more potent testosterone. The free tea is almost always higher, in my opinion, Apples to apples with a given total, I'm going to see a higher free testosterone on the cream. And I think that's due to the no ester dosing twice a day, the frequency of it. Um, and so, yeah. And I mean, if, if you want to claim it's the serum DHT, prove it, like go for it. I don't know how you could, because that serum level is not indicative of the tissue level. Like you're going to start taking scalp biopsies and all that and try to figure out your DHT. You can, but would it matter? I mean, you could lower your, your cream dose. Um, you could go to injections if it was an issue, like some guys just do, but I, I haven't noticed any excess shedding on the cream since I switched. I mean, I'm definitely slowly losing hair like here, you know, the, the recession it's going to happen. I'm almost 44. And I started shedding years ago when I was taking compounds, DHT derivative compounds, I'd shed like crazy. So I sped that up on, you know, on my own. And then, but when I switched to the cream, I have, I look back, I thought I was losing it faster. I look back at pictures for two or three years ago. It's, it hasn't, it's not really much different at all. It's just in my head, but it, again, trial and error. If it, if you feel like that, look at your free T levels too, though. Don't, and don't, why would you measure the serum DHT? Are you going to take finasteride? Like I would highly recommend not to, uh, cause then you're systemically dropping DHT everywhere, not just your scalp. And that's why I tell people it's like, it's like taking out an anthill, with a nuke. So you take out the whole city just to get rid of an anthill. That's stupid. So if you're going to do anything topical, yeah, you'll still get some systemic absorption, but it's definitely safer than a, than a pill. Um, but a lot of guys I think need to, I understand the hair issue. I do. I, I really do. It, it's an individual choice, but I would encourage guys not to fret about their hair to the point that it overcomes their health. But that's just my own advice. I've missed a few here and there, maybe uh, one last one there. I've been on TRT for a few months, but I can't get rid of the brain fog. What's your recommendation? We'd have to know a lot more information. We'd have to know your protocol. We'd have to know your blood levels. We'd have to know whether medicines you're on. I mean, thyroid levels. Thyroid's another one. That's a big one that uh, I didn't really look into until the last year or so, probably, and started treating, you know, becoming comfortable treating people with thyroid. even even with normal blood markers. I mean, to a true trial of, of thyroid optimization. And I did it to myself. My wife and I started taking NP thyroid uh, probably six months ago. Um, and I feel better. I already felt good on cream, but just a little bit better. Like I'm not getting the 2 p.m. slumps anymore, you know? And again, did I need this from a lab standpoint or a mainstream medicine standpoint? No. Uh, that's okay though. Like it, it, there's nothing wrong with trialing certain things. It's no different than DHE or pregnenolone. When people trial these to say, Hey, can I feel a little better when I, when I do take them and you feel worse, stop taking it. You don't need it. Same thing with thyroid. If you take it and feel worse and you try different things and you don't, don't take it. Um, we felt better. And I do think in a lot of people, uh, again, it could be this like tissue resistance stuff going on. Um, we're just supplementing with thyroid. And I started low. I started with like 30 milligrams of NP thyroid a day which is like female dose basically. Um, and I'm on 60 milligrams a day now, which is still very, fairly low. Um, but my TSH is less than one. I mean, every, all the other markers are quote unquote good. 
Uh, I'm not a big believer in the free T3, free T4 for the same reason of the intricate process, right? Like you don't need to just base everything off of the blood levels. Go with how you feel. You'll figure out if you're too high on thyroid, I promise. When you go too high, anybody who's ever taken T3 by itself, like in college when, for fat loss, you know you know what it feels like to be too high on T3. Uh, so you'll know probably if you start getting jittery and sweating and feeling weird. But I do think, I would say for that guy though, we don't have enough information. So you'd have to really look into this protocol and everything. And for this uh, 2 p.m. dips, um, do you take it before lunch then? No, I actually take it in the morning and I take both of them. I take my two pills in the morning only. I don't dose it twice a day and it seems to last long enough for me. And I think Dave Lee has mentioned that too in his group where people ask twice a day versus once a day and his experience, same thing. Once a day seems to be fine. Um, but that's again, trial and error. I did try taking it twice a day at first. I just, I don't like taking pills twice a day. It's hard for me to remember to do it, uh, which is a problem with a lot of people. So I just do my two in the morning and I feel great. So, yeah. Yeah, All right. So um, in your practice uh, that you're starting very soon or extending very soon on the hormone things, uh, you're optimizing hormones as well uh, for the thyroid. Uh... Yeah, so mainly uh, sex hormones, obviously. Um, and and I'm, I'm treating the males, you know, and so testosterone first and foremost with thyroid optimization. And I've started doing more peptide if people are interested in it. You know, it depends on what they're asking for. If it's something that's brand spanking new, no real research behind it. I'm a little more hesitant, um, but a lot of the the tried and true, you know, peptides, you know, BPC-157, ipamorelin, tisimorelin, sermorelin, you know, those are the more popular ones. Um, TB-500, I think there's issues now with compounding of that. I think the FDA cracked down or it was the Federal Trade Commission. I'm not sure. I think there were some clinics promoting its use for a cure for something we shall not name. And they got in trouble for doing that. And so I think they might have cracked down on some compounders. I can't remember. I need to look into it. But I've had guys ask me about the TB500 and I've had trouble uh, getting it from the normal compounders. So, um, but, you know, IGF LR3 is another popular one that a lot of people want to try. There's all kinds now. But, um, you know, a lot of people are asking about growth hormone, like legit growth hormone. I can't prescribe growth hormone. Like, I don't know how these longevity clinics do it in the US. You, you know, if you look into the regulations around growth hormone prescription, you it's it's worse than testosterone. I mean, you've got to have a legit diagnosis of like adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome. Plus, it's ridiculously expensive. Um, even if you were paying cash, you know, not many people are going to pay for it. So but I do. I like the peptides. I started in CJC 1295 personally about four or five months ago. Um, and just the benefits from sleep alone have been enough for me to keep taking it. I mean, I'm not getting any of the big GH type effects as far as water retention or weight gain or any of that stuff. Um, but I, I'm okay with that actually. Uh, it's, I think it's that quick pulse at night while you sleep gets you in that deeper sleep. And I wake up feeling really good. I, I, it's not like taking for me, melatonin made me feel terrible the next day. Um, and so this is just for me. And so I do recommend that to patients. They'll talk a lot of times about their sleep. And as long as they've had sleep study and they don't have apnea and all that, we're like, hey, maybe you want to try some ipamorelin or something and see. So, yeah, anyway, we're going to be doing that in the practice. Just keep it simple. I'm not going to be a primary care provider. Like I'm not treating hypertension. I'm not doing any of that. This is a, a very niche. I mean, typical TRT clinic type stuff, I guess. But we're trying to keep it on a, a real more personal type relationship building level. Cause that's, that's what I enjoy is, I mean, I've become friends with so many of my patients. We're, we're, we're close because we, I don't know, I take the, I think spending the time and talking to them about all these other parts of their life, you know, not just the hormones, but how's your diet, how's your sleep, how's your marriage? Are you working out? Like, tell me about your routine. Like we just talk about all that. So yeah, I think it's going to be fun. Awesome. I wish you all the success with the career switch. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, I appreciate you doing uh, this, uh, taking your time to help uh, a lot of other men for free. Um, so thanks again. And um, yeah, uh, we'll talk to each other in the chats and in the um, um, comments uh, in YouTube and in the Facebook group with the same name. That's so all the viewers still watching, thank you for being with us and uh, see you next time. Thanks, Bye, guys. Jordan. Bye, Steven. Bye.